Amen. King Jesus comes righteous, bringing blessings of salvation to God's people. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's truth through the preaching of the word, which begins with prayer. Let us pray together. The eternal God, whose word silences the shouts of the unholy, whose word silences the shouts of the Almighty, we shout out to you, Lord God, to come. Come and save us, Lord God. Quiet within us, every voice but yours. Speak to us through the suffering and death of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may receive grace and we may feel the love, your love, upon us in our lives as we go forth to serve you. We pray all this in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Seeking sanctuary. Seeking sanctuary sanctuary. The, the Russian-Ukrainian war is well into its, what, second month now, it is well into its second month. The Russian invasion to the Ukraine has triggered Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. Now, this is the largest refugee crisis since World War II. More than 4.3 million Ukrainians have left their country. And, and of their entire population, a quarter of their population has been basically displaced. All in an effort to find sanctuary, to find a sanctuary. Why are the Ukrainians wanting to find a sanctuary, you ask? Well, they're trying to escape the ravages of the war. So then, what is a sanctuary? What is a sanctuary? Well, a sanctuary is a refuge, a, a place of safety where they can live, a place where they and their families can live in safety. When when they when someone seeks a sanctuary, they're looking for uh, the freedom from their fears. They're trying to escape their fears of being tormented or injured or even killed by an enemy who is seeking to destroy them. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what it would feel like in an environment like that? You ever wondered about that? Have you ever placed yourself in their shoes where you wondered, what would it feel like if you were just on the run, just left your house, grabbed a few things and took off and started just walking, driving if you could, seeking a sanctuary where you could find peace and rest. The reality is that all of us, all of us, each and every one of us, have been seeking a sanctuary since the very beginning. We have been seeking a refuge since the very beginning, since the fall of humanity. Today's Palm Sunday, uh, a day when we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into the, the city of Jerusalem. We do this every year as a reminder of this entry, this triumphal entry now, what, what we try to do every year when we worship is to rem remember what is the significance of this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What is the significance of it? Well, to understand the significance of what is taking place as Jesus enters Jerusalem, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back all the way to the beginning of creation. In fact, right after creation before the fall. We got to go back to the very beginning. And we need to go back to where it all started. 
uh, where it started in the Garden, the Garden of Eden. By the way, the Garden of Eden was a sanctuary. Why was it a sanctuary? Well, because there was peace and and there was rest. And and, and, and Adam and Eve were in the presence of God himself. They were in the presence of the Lord. They were in a sanctuary where God dwelled with them. This was a place of total fulfillment. It was a place of fellowship with God. A place of shalom, peace, and harmony with God. Dare we even dream of such a place? But we've been promised a place like that. But because of the fall, because of sin, humanity, we were, were vanquished from this sanctuary, this holy sanctuary, this, this presence, this holy presence from God. We were, we were sent out and a flaming, air, a flaming sword was placed at the entrance of this sanctuary, this garden of Eden, this garden to keep us away from the presence of God, to block us from God's holy presence by God's justice. He does that by his justice. A sinner could not be in the presence of the Lord and live. So he sends us out. Now, as we go forth in time, okay, as we look at God's covenantal promise, God's covenantal promise was that God established a covenant with his people. And as he starts going and his covenant starts coming to fruition, it goes through a man named Abraham. Uh, in the beginning, God spoke to Abraham, and he spoke to others, including Moses. But to further commune with his people, God established in the wilderness, if you remember the story, God created a sanctuary in the wilderness where he could meet with his people. A sanctuary, uh, a, a tabernacle, if you will. Same difference, a, sa uh, a sanctuary, uh, a tent where God could draw near to his people and he would speak to them, uh, the, to the high priest. In, a, in the sanctuary, if you recall how it was structured, it, again, this was a tent because it had to be mobile because they were moving around in the wilderness. In the sanctuary was a throne room. Remember, the throne room was the Holy of Holies. So you have this big old tent, and in, in this tent you have another tent with within there. This is what they call a throne room, and it was guarded by a thick curtain, a curtain that kept anyone from going in there, and there was the Ark of the Covenant there. Uh, there was a, that, that, it was the ark where God met with the high priest once a year and spoke to the high priest. You remember the, the, the outline of the ark? There's not one here. There's usually one somewhere around here. Uh, you have an ark, a golden ark. You have two cherubim uh, with their arrows pointing forward and almost touching, but not quite. And in that little gap between there, God says, that is the seat of mercy. That is where I will meet with you and talk to you. So that was, that was what was in the sanctuary. The Holy of Holy was there, and, in this, uh, and to keep people from going, priests from going in there and dying, they, uh, God, they set up a curtain. It was a barrier that only allowed the high priest to go in there once a year. Okay, now, I, we, I've, I know I've spoken about this before, but I'll, I'll remind you that on this curtain, this barrier that, 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 that led the way into the Holy of Holies, were drawings on this curtain, drawings of the Garden of Eden, drawings of whatever the garden had in it. So there were drawings on this curtain. It was a big, huge curtain. It also had angels on it, cherubim on it. It was a reminder. It was like that. It was a reminder that the Garden of Eden was a sanctuary where God, holy presence, was with humans, with humanity. And it talks about that in Exodus chapter 26. Now, within the Holy of Holies uh, sat the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of, of the Testimony, if you will. And, and in Exodus 25, 22, God says this, There I will meet with you, and from above, uh, there I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, that 
That is where the ark of the testimony lies. I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandments for the people of Israel. Okay, so God is saying, this is where I'm going to meet with you. This is where I'm going to speak with you. This was a, the sanctuary, if you will, now here on earth among his people in a fallen world. Now, to, now there's a reason for this. So stay with me. Uh, now, as you move forward, eventually a physical temple, a physical sanctuary was built, uh, not by King David, but by his son, Solomon. God allowed Solomon to build him a physical, permanent sanctuary, if you will, temple where the Holy of Holies was, where the Ark of the Covenant would rest. Okay, now, we have to say this about that temple. God reluctantly allowed Solomon to build it. But when he does that, he, he, God makes uh, the Lord God, a, uh, he, he, makes a, he makes a comment. He makes reference to a future temple that was going to be built by a son of David. And this is in reference to the Messiah, the Messiah that was to be coming, that would be coming. And he said, and God makes reference to this, saying that it would be this son who would build a truly permanent house for God. Okay. Now this is all reference, we know now, <clears throat> this is all reference to the Messiah who is still yet to come. Now again, since we know that Solomon was not the true son that, that God was speaking about when he when he when he foretold this through the prophets, uh, we know that God was talking about someone else. And so, and, and because we know that this wasn't the true temple that Solomon built, what happened to that temple? It was destroyed by the Babylonians. The Babylonians totally destroyed it, took everything away from there. Okay, so now we come across a second temple that was built. Now, some may have thought maybe that's the temple because it was from a dis another descendant of the kingship of David. So they built the second temple, but what, come to find out that this second temple was extremely small in comparison to the first temple. It wasn't this grand vision that's given to us in, in the Old Testament. It was a smaller temple. In fact, the people, the older people that saw the foundation of the second temple started weeping because in grandeur, it didn't even meet the first temple. But, uh, but again, so that was the second temple that was built. But one of the things that happened during the Babylonian exile was a, was a prophecy, a new prophecy from Ezekiel. The prophet Ezekiel says that there would be a new temple. And again, this is when they were in exile. And they, again, when the second temple was built, we know that wasn't it because it would because because of the prophecy Ezekiel tells us. Ezekiel prophesies a new temple, a new sanctuary that was going to be built by a new David that would be much grander than Solomon's temple. So grand would this temple be? This is incredible to think about. The prophecy by Ezekiel said that this, this, this temple would be so grand that the glory of God would fit into it. That's stunning. That's stunning because God is eternal. And for, uh, for people back then, even for us today, we try to, we just, it's beyond our comprehension to, to, to think about a temple that grand, but we know now who it was and who it is. Okay, so this new temple will become so large that all the nations of the earth will come to it and will come into it, Ezekiel 37. That's the prophecy that he gives. Now the temple that was built after the exile was not that temple. There's no way that could have been the temple. And the people really knew it. They, they cried when they saw the foundation of how small it was. It did, not feel the, it did not fit this grand vision that was prophesied. So uh, the, again, the prophet's vision of, the, of God's new temple 
was to be built by a new David. And that David is a, a messianic figure. It is the Messiah. It is the Christ who came later. It is Jesus Christ who came later. Jesus is the one who fulfills all these New Testament prophecies, uh, all these Old Testament prophecies. Jesus fulfills them in the New Testament. Jesus, the, he is the depiction of the final temple. He is the defection of the final temple. When it says that, that God, all of God's glory would fit into this new temple, that is Christ. Christ is the new temple. He is the one who would bring salvation to the world. It, it is uh, unfathomable uh, of, of the riches and, and, and the wisdom uh, of our Savior and who he is to think that Jesus Christ is the final temple and through Christ we now have access to whom? To, to God himself. We have access to the presence of the Lord through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, new to, that's the gospel. That's the gospel message. So now we get into the, to, to the passage. Now we get into Mark chapter 11. And, and so we needed that background to be, get a better understanding of what's taking place. Now, we, we, we see the picture when we, at the beginning of Mark chapter 11 that Jesus, that King Jesus comes, uh, comes righteous, bringing ble the blessing of salvation to God's people. Now, we need to know that chapter 11 is the last chapter, basically for the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11 is the end of, starts the end of Jesus' life. Jesus will be will be murdered by the end of the week, which, which is basically started here in chapter 11 in this gospel. Now, as we look at the first six verses of this passage, these first six verses, have you noticed how it gets into detail? Just in six verses, it gets into detail about what? About a donkey. And, and, and it gets into detail how, how Jesus gives extremely specific instructions to his disciples of what they are to do, where they are to go, and where they would find a donkey, a cult of a donkey, a cult, okay? Not, a, not an adult donkey. And that's going to be very significant, okay? So, and, and what, what's going on here? Well, we know that what's happening here is that, that Jesus is basically fulfilling what has already been said in Scripture. Now, Jesus is doing what Jesus is going to do. When we talk about prophecy, well, that's just a prophet foreseeing that for us. And the, the prophet uh, is, um, uh, Ezekiel, no, the, the prophecy of uh, Zechariah, Chapter 9, verse 9 says this. Now, this is back in the Old Testament that prophesies what, what's taking place during that time in, in Mark 11. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Is he humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey? The Old Testament book of the prophet uh, Zechariah, chapter 9, chapters 9 through 14, are very critical in understanding what's taking place during this triumphant um, entry by Jesus into Jerusalem. It, it's critical for us to understand it because basically he is fulfilling uh, prophecy, but it tells us what's going on. Okay, it first tells us that the king, the Messiah, the Messiah will be riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then the prophecy goes on to end in chapter 14 in a very stunning way. It says this. It says, on that day, holy to the Lord will be uh, inscribed on the bells of the horses and on the cooking pots. And in the Lord's house will be like a sacred bowl bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty. And on that day, there will be no longer, there will no longer be Canaanites in the house of the Lord God Almighty. 
what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us some amazing stuff. It, it is telling us, we're being told here that the king, this Messiah, is going to turn the entire, basically the entire world into a giant holy of holies. Now, what's in the Holy of Holies? God, the presence of the Lord. And, then, and it's telling us that, the, that they, basically the whole world is going to be a holy sanctuary. And God will be living among us. God will, we will be in the presence of the Lord. This is, this is breathtaking. This is overwhelming. This is an overwhelming vision that the, prophet, the, that the prophecy has. That even the cooking pots are holy. They're set aside for the Lord. The Holy of Holies will, will extend to the entire world. And that even the Canaanites, the foreigners, if you will, will be holy. The Canaanites, Gentiles, us, will be holy. And will be residing in, this, in, in the house of the Lord, Zechariah chapter 14. This means that the, the, the Messiah will not simply build a building. He is the building. He, he is the mediator to the presence of the Lord. He will be the doorway to God. He is the final temple. He is the final sanctuary. So our passage is in essence showing us how Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament uh, it, how, how he fulfills all the prophecies of the Old Testament that are, that are related or tied to the Messiah, tied to, to the Christ and to the temple. So when we read about all this, what does this teach us about Christ? What does it teach us about Z Jesus being so specific about the writings and the prophecies of the Old Testament? What does it tell us about Christ? Well, it tells us that Jesus is in complete control of what's happening. It is not by chance that the, that, that, that the Passion Week is happening. It is not by chance that he's, that he's riding on a, a colt of a, of a donkey. None of this is by chance. Jesus Christ is in complete control of the end of his life. His death is voluntary. He wasn't put to death. Well, he was put to death, but it's a voluntary death that he laid his life down for us. Jesus has an, an amazing knowledge and commitment to Holy Scripture because he is the Almighty. He is the one and only. In verse 2, Jesus makes it clear. He makes it clear to the disciples that the, that the, the, the donkey they're getting is a cult, Okay which no one has ever written, no one has ever written upon. Why is that detail significant? And I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you a string of questions, and I'm going to answer it for us, okay? Because these are questions that we have. We read these passages, and we have these questions. Like, Why is that? Why is that? Why is he talking about that? Why is he bringing up that? Why are they spending six verses on a donkey? Well, okay, so we go back to why, is it, why was it important for it to be a cult, and, and what does it symbolize? Okay, so so when when we when we look at why these why it's important for it to be a cult, we go to another we can go to another passage, First uh, Samuel chapter six verses verses seven basically. You recall the story of when the the Philistines took possession of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, they took they took a possession, they took it back to their country wherever they had it. And the people started getting diseases and dying and all that because they because this ark was there. So they didn't want anything else to do with this ark. They wanted to send it back to Jerusalem. They wanted to send it back. Uh, and this is what the, their instructions were on how they could send it back because they couldn't even touch it. They were dying. And, and so they get specific instructions on how they could send the ark back. And it says this. It says, uh, now then, take and prepare a new cart. Okay, so this is going to be a cart that the that the Ark of the Covenant is going to be on, and this is the instructions again that the that the Israelites are giving to the uh, uh, to to the Philistines on how to return it. So take a new cart with two milk cows with, uh, on which there has never been a yoke. A yoke is uh, uh, an apparatus 
that that's put on the shoulders of a of a cow, a bull, a donkey, or something else that pull a plow or something. That's a yoke, <coughs> the burden. Okay, so it says that there has never the, the two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and a yoke, and then put that yoke on these cows, these new cows. Okay. Uh, and and then uh, put the yoke on the cows of the of, of the cart, and then take. They were commanded to take their calves from them, remove their calves from them, and just have these new cows. All right. So now that is how the ark was set back. And, and so we ask the question as to why is that so? Why does it have to be that way? Well, because God deserves our best. God deserves our supreme best. He doesn't deserve. A cow had, or, a, or a bull that has been used before. He wants something pristine. He wants something dedicated only to him uh, for the first time. He doesn't take anything used before, so to speak. So they had to give up their best to be able to send it back to him. And the same is going, the same is going on with this cult. It had to be a cult that had never been written upon by anyone. And so it had to be a new, a cult, a younger than what, four? And, and it had to be something that was, that was sacred. Uh, it, it, was good. it was going to be used for, for a sacred task. I mean, can you imagine this cult is carrying the Messiah? He's carrying God incarnate. And God does not deserve a donkey that had been used before. So it had to be a cult. It had to be very something very precious, something that's used for the first time to do what it did, and that was to carry the Messiah. It's for a sacred task. He deserved the best because he he is the Lord. And so, and by the way, the the, the this tri, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is written in all four Gospels. Okay. <clears throat> and, and there's a little confusion because you know, there's a talk about it being a donkey and the other talk about being a cult of a donkey. And then some people thought, well, maybe you rode on the donkey and the cult together or something. I said, no, no. He rode only the cult. That's, who, that's how Jesus enters the city. Why a donkey? Well, a, do a donkey is an animal of peace, symbolizing peace, not a war horse. Okay, so as we go on and we look at verses 7 through 10, uh, we ask the question, what, uh, what do we learn? What do we learn by the cries of the crowd? What do we learn from, by the cries of the crowd? Uh, they, they are basically welcoming what? Royalty. They are welcoming royalty. The people are, greed, are sending a greeting that they would give to a king. The people are laying down their cloaks, their, their, their coats, on the ground so that, so that Jesus could come upon them and ride over them. And when they ran out of, of, of cloaks, they got, went and got branches. And in that area, there were palm branches, and they just laid them down. They were basically giving them the red carpet treatment, if you will, that you would give to a king. They also used these branches to wave at Jesus. So they laid them on the floor, red carpet treatment of a king, and they also waved these, these branches to symbolize what? To symbolize that all of creation calls out to the glory of God. The mountains clap, the, the trees sing. I mean, they wave like the trees waving the branches, glorify, doing what they're, what they're called to do to glorify God. That's why they were waving their branches to signify the coming, the coming of God, the coming of Christ. Then they, then they shouted out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. What is that? Where did that come from? Well, we know that that is a greeting prayer, and it comes from the Old Testament, Psalm 118, verses 25 and 20, uh, 26. Uh, they're just repeating the psalm. They're saying, save us. 
we pray. Save us, we pray, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Hosanna literally means save us, save us. They were, cry they were crying that, they were shouting that to Jesus as he was coming in. The Jews during that time were expecting a political and military savior. Okay, because they were being oppressed by the by the Romans. No one was expecting this. Not one. They were not expecting a Messiah who was coming, bringing complete salvation for the soul and body of a person, for the souls and body of humanity, all who believe in him. So I want to ask you this. I want you to stop and think about this. In your life right now, with everything that's going on in your life right now, and with all the things going on in the world today, I want you to think about this. If you could picture a king coming to save you and your nation and your the U.S. or whatever, and the world, would you want a king who could bring political and military and financial stability? Or would you want a king who could bring salvation to your soul and body and everything else stays the same? I'm being think about this. this is an honest question that you can you only want to answer to yourself if you're honest to yourself. Would you want a king? This is what the dilemma of the Jews were, the Israelites. Would you want a king who could bring stability to your life in a political and in, in a finan in a financial in a political area realm? And even in the military, for those, th imagine if you were living in the Ukraine. Well, what if you were living in Ukraine and you asked the same question is asked of you? Which one would you want? Would you want a king to come to stop the war, to bring political and military stability and financial stability to your life? Or would you want a king that says, I want your soul. I bring salvation to your soul and body. Which one would you choose? Everything else would stay the same. Everything else would stay the same. All the politics, all the military situations, all would stay the same. Which one would you choose? It's a, it's a tough question, if you're honest. But if you have the bigger picture, which you do, God has given you the, the grand picture. He is, He's already told you there's a there's a kingdom on the other side. There's a kingdom that's coming. In fact, you're living in the kingdom that's already started. The final kingdom will still to, is still to come. Hook say, here's a follow-up question to, to that question. I think everybody got 100 on that. Okay, okay here's a follow-up question. Has Jesus made a triumphal entry into your heart? Has he made a triumphal entry into your heart? If so, does he reign in you with love and peace? That's kingdom living. That's what it's about. That's what we're looking at today. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that Jesus is not primarily a teacher, but he's a savior. He's a savior. That's what Mark's talking about. He's not here to give us moral guidance, so to speak. He's here to save us. Certainly spiritual guidance. It means that being a Christian is not primarily being a nice person. It means that that you, you have, that something radical has happened to you. That you have been regenerated, born again. You, your heart of stone has been removed. You've been given a heart of flesh. You have been sprinkled with the blood, with the with the Holy Spirit, with the water of the Holy Spirit, and born again. 
And that's, that's what Jesus brings into our lives. As King Jesus comes righteous, bringing the blessings of salvation to your people. We receive them singing, uh, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord, who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Father.